Our scripture reading this morning is from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to invite the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And let's pause there, remembering that this is not the first nor the last time that Jesus reminds us he's not here to judge. And then he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do? for I have no place to store all my stuff. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, on this very night, your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasure for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God. You are our strength. You are our Redeemer. Amen. Nadia Boltz Weber. Many of you probably know that name. Nadia Boltz Weber is the the edgy, six foot tall, totally tattooed pastor who is beloved in the Christian church progressive circles. I've followed her for years, read all her books, heard her speak several times. One of the early stories I remember her telling was about her ordination and specifically about the, the music that she chose for this very, very special worship service. Why did she choose all old traditional hymns and not some happy, peppy contemporary song like, Our God is an Awesome God? And I remember her saying in her droll, sarcastic way, Guys, pizza is awesome. God isn't a pizza. God is a mighty fortress. And I've just always remembered that story, and, and it, it, it pops in my mind every time I use or somebody else uses the word awesome. <laughs> awesome. Amazing. The bomb. Our culture is obsessed with superlatives in a way that God is not. Our human culture is obsessed with awesome, 
fantastic, more, better, most, the best, in a way that God is not. The parable that we hear Jesus tell today points this out. The man in the parable is obsessed with superlatives. He had stuff, and now he has more stuff. He has barns, and now he has bigger, better barns. Maybe soon he'll have the most stuff and the greatest barns. And then God says to the man, you fool. Brothers and sisters, we are the man in Jesus' parable. We get it. We all want the mug. You know the mug. It's the white mug with the white lettering that says the world's greatest pastor. <laughs> Maybe you don't want that particular mug. <laughs> But we want the mug, the world's greatest. The world's greatest dad, the world's greatest daughter, son, family. The world's greatest student, college, university, company, boss. The world's greatest athlete, the world's greatest sport, the world's greatest team. We humans are obsessed with superlatives in a way that God is not. God's desire for us is not the greatest. God's desire for us is faithfulness. Faithfulness. In the book of Micah 6 8, we hear this so clearly. God has told you, O oh mortal, what is good, to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God. It was back in 1945 that a fellow named Donald Winnicott he was, he was a British pediatrician and a child psychiatrist. Well, this fellow challenged our human obsession with greatness and affirmed God's desire for faithfulness when he coined the phrase and published the book about the good enough mother. The good enough mother. We've all heard that phrase. That, that, that's been with us since 1945. Winnicott knew that faithfulness and good enough, not greatness, go hand in hand. A faithful life is not about being the perfect parent. A faithful life is not about being the greatest dad. A faithful life is about being a good enough mother. Now, according to Winnicott, a good enough mother is not simply someone who will, will she'll do, right? <laughs> That's not what he's getting at. What he's getting at is a good enough mother is able to manage a really difficult task. And that task is to raise another human being in such a way that they know without a doubt that they are loved and cared for and also that they know without a doubt that they are ready to take their place in this world. 
that is filled with vagaries and challenges and sufferings. A good enough parent is one who raises a good enough human being prepared to live in a good enough world. I don't know about you, but living a good enough life in a good enough world makes a lot of sense to me. A good enough life is the radical vision of the Christian church that is outlined in the New Testament scriptures. And I am so grateful to Courtney for talking about that good enough world (laughs) and what it means to live a good enough life in this world. A good enough life is the radical vision in which each and every one of us, all humans and all nature as well, has sufficient resources to handle living in a world of joy and sorrow, feast and famine, change and complexity. A good enough life in a good enough world enough resources, not too few, not too many, enough, the good enough life. Jesus' parable about the man, about more and bigger and better and best and the greatest barns, when God says, you fool, I don't hear that as judgment. I hear that as love. You fool, my dear beloved child. My dear beloved child. If you only find meaning in greatness, you're so lost. If you only find meaning in greatness, you are so lost. The good enough life is about walking humbly with God in a good enough world. Can we take delight in seeing a cardinal without having to think, that's the best cardinal in the world? (laughs) The good enough life in a good enough world. Can we take delight in having dinner with our beloved without having to think, that's the best dinner in the world? The good enough life in a good enough world. It's about about love. It's about kindness. It's about justice for all because we are all in this world together. And living a good enough life is not easy, brothers and sisters, because here's what a good enough life demands of us, that we smile at the person who's in line ahead of us, who is fumbling around to find their checkbook to write a check at Hy-Vee when all we want to do is tap and go. (laughs) Right? It's a good enough world. And to be able to smile at that person, that's a good enough life. A good enough life is not easy. It takes effort to remember that my life is better because of the people who toil in the fields, the people who wash the dishes, the people who fix our roads. And so maybe, maybe I should do something to ensure that they have decent housing 
and health care. It takes effort to live a good enough life in this good enough world. It takes effort to honor both the abundance and the limitations of our planet as it seeks to provide good enoughness for the infinite birds and insects and streams and whales that our planet is trying to support. Brothers and sisters, if we can achieve any of these things, to smile, to care about those who make our lives better, to work for justice in our world, if we can do any of these, these acts of kindness and justice and love, it will not not be because we have achieved greatness. If we can achieve any of these things, these acts of justice, these acts of love, these acts of kindness, it will be because we have put greatness aside and opted instead to walk humbly with our loving God. Amen.